know what to say, but thank you so much for coming. What a wonderful crowd. Uh, welcome to the first uh, creative writing program event for the academic year 2023 to 2024. Uh, I would like to welcome all of you. Please help yourself with food and talk and mingle with, with each other. We are all meeting here after a long time, I guess. Um, I also would like to welcome back our colleague and friend, Maggie Zorowski, after spending one year in Poland. So welcome Yay. back, Maggie. So good to see you. Uh, and uh, I know you would have, you could have done something even better than this, but we are really, really cool. So that's why you have chosen <laughs> us. I know that. So thank you. Um, my name is Arunika Kashyap. I'm the director of the Creative Writing Program. And we are here today together to celebrate the work of three wonderful writers. They are um, Colin Bischoff, Jeremiah Akbakin, and Eric Brown. Uh, they will be, yes, please, <laughs> hand. They're the uh, new PhD students uh, in our program. And I will uh, uh, first invite Dr. Lian Hao uh, to, invite, uh, to introduce Jeremiah Akbakin. And then uh, Professor Andrew Zawaki will introduce Eric Brown and I will introduce Colin Bischoff. And that's how we'll, do, we'll, we'll go. And, and each of them will read, and after that we can uh, speak and hang out, hang out here and, and eat more, and chat more. <laughs> Thank you again for coming. Oh my gosh, I'm so glad that we're all back together. And uh, I look forward to spending a good year this year with everybody in the program and in the Department of English. So I'm here to introduce uh, O. Jeremiah Agbakin. I just hope I got the last E correct. And he's the author of The Sign of the Ram and uh, from Akashic Books 2023 and he was selected by Kwame Dons and uh, Chris Abani for the New Generation African Poets chat book. His poems are recently published in the for forthcoming Beloit Poetry Journal, Cincinnati Review, Kenyon Review, Pleiades Poetry, Poet Lore, and um, Poetry Daily. He is the Tin House Scholar and has placed second for the Grist Journal Performa Contest um, finalist of the Chad Wall <coughs> chat book series. Black Warrior Review Contest, and the Silver, Silverman First Book Prize for African po Poets. Uh, as you can tell, I frequently butcher <laughs> names <laughs> and places, but please join me in welcoming him to read tonight for us as a, as a new PhD candidate. Good evening. Uh, my name is Mr. Jeremiah Agbaki. Thank you for the introduction. Um, I'll be reading uh, some poems from my chapbook, uh, which is here. Um, and the first poem I would like to read is the first poem I wrote in America when I was battling with writer's blog. So I was thinking about a way to break the blog. And what was the best way to break a writer's blog in Mississippi than to pay homage? to uh, black bodies that have been uh, a site of violence. And this poem is titled to Devotion. So it's written in the honor of Justine, who is the uh, youngest um, person to be executed by the uh, electric chair in America. So Devotion for Justine and Elimanet. I crouch under the same dome of the sky. A gold hangs from a missing rope. The closest I ever came to gold was in blood. I feel so dizzy with believing. But any river, scrubbed, holds no gospel, no flash of a new fish, and I long for the mud snake again. I surrender to the arrows one life. 
to the steel pan, a pole hollowed with many voices, as the archery, the colander's wound, when stricken by the panists, and I am stricken, Lord God. I bow before the sun seated on the electric chair, long after his rushed crown, a throne full of power too much for him. The angels make way, make way. It's true that the crown crackled first with the securest rattle. It is true that the crackle grew to a lightning, a clap and clap, knowing that a song is heading towards silence. Um, I know that was a difficult one, so uh, please bear with me. Um, the next poem that I'm going to be reading is uh, Light Years. So uh, this is a poem that also um, examines violence in religion, violence that has been uh, legitimized because of the command of a god, and precisely through the lens of the story of Isaac in the Bible and other Abrahamic religions in which God told him to sacrifice his son and then as a test of faith. So this is after a painting by Caravaggio which is tied to the sacrifice of Isaac. Light years. In a past life, you are still light painting. The light took so long to enter. Come, find the sky and all its dark matter. Its sudden meteor shower, like blood spurting from the ram's neck at the feast of the Eid. Drained, the man finds new color in the blood cross of communion wine. The platelet bind the bristles as the sun bleeds from his eyes. For the half light, you will have to tarry for days until the plot darkens a bit. For the shade between hemorrhage and blood meal, you lead the painter where he should go with his fingers. You lead the angel to the knife holding a hand in filicide. You hide every body part in canvas. So blessed is the man who can make a mouth and make it scream and stop at once. Like centuries later, Picasso's weeping woman and red pins Ivan the Terrible, like an ember holding its breath in a coal. Blessed is the mouth too, for talking to a painter in a language brief as the color between them. For heeding the sculptor's creed, I bet you nearby more rigid, beware the Jesus vanity as it carves and carves. Beware the bristles stiffened like a cat's whiskers soaked in blood. And uh, the third poem I'll be reading today is actually a self confession. Uh, when I was in elementary school, um, I said something against the teacher, and then the teacher was going to punish me, and then I lied that it was my best friend that said it. Fortunately, my best friend was not in school, and unfortunately, I betrayed my friend. So this is an attempt to redeem myself and uh, redeem the act of betrayal <laughs> through the lens of the story of Isaac, who was uh, going to be sacrificed. Isaac's conversion. At the toss of a coin, I would do anything to save myself. Father, don't we burn enough offering to keep you warm? The ash survives what is left of the fire. The smoke pops in vain. I confess. I've confessed a friend to the edge of a teacher, teacher's rage. Okoko, the school's pilot, armed with his quiver of canes, I confessed after breaking my bread for him, year long, or was it before the deed? I cannot remember what came before, but I was tender once. It's so easy that he was shrieking with fever before assembly. What could God do with the missing sacrifice? The God of raised weep armed with the quiver of kings. What can you do with me, a beast with no heart, long dead even before the knife? 
a fire won't touch a thing like that. I confess, I have too much heart left in me. Believe me, I am marked with the sign of the ram. You must not forsake me. So you guys might tell that I'm noticeably shaking. I'm trying to uh, regulate my body temperature because this room is quite cold. Um, <laughs> so bear with me. And I'm going to read the last one for today, which is titled Good Friday. Uh, it's also a poem that deals with uh, violence, father son violence, whether it's divine or earthly. Good Friday. Father is everything but a good snake charmer. Tell me, do you see only that shiver in the hands and not the restless animal steadied into a hole? In the fog, a wounded lamb limbs. Half of the sun cobwebbed with clouds by cave spiders. My tongue is a small sponge of vinegar. And teeth, spittle-washed stalagmites, lip, stone slab, sealing the tomb endowed to the sun in perpetuity. The lamb will be unswallowed after three days and three nights of indigestion. The tomb's gizzard dulled. The cord bruised, but alive. Those back mites, those bite marks are visible from the cold nails. Like the lamb, I want to herd my own flock. But father shares his wool with his own teeth and splits his hooves into claws. Father rubs honey for ointment and palm oil for, for tony. The proverb sets the wolf either free or on fire. Like me, the lamb is the father of the man. Thank you. Just drop the mic, it's probably better. Um, it's great to see so many people here. Rather than uh, do kindly as my colleague Aruni has just done and welcome Maggie back to campus, I prefer in public to commiserate with her for having had to leave Warsaw. <laughs> it is nice to have you back. I think we were feeling a little anemic there uh, without your presence. So our energy is, is back and in full force. Um, great to see so many of you here. Um, my job is very simple. Eric Brown, there you are, a uh, man after my own heart, has submitted a very distilled uh, bio note for his introduction. So Eric is a queer poet living in Athens now, uh, of course, doing his PhD here. Um, he comes to us from the University of Houston, a very fancy MFA program there, a fancy and very wealthy program. I hope you won't feel too down and out while you're here. <laughs> I think we're doing our best by you, but it's not missionary either. Um, and um, while he was there, he was a digital editor of a really fantastic national, well, international literary journal called Gulf Coast, um, which is published annually or biannually? Bi yeah, twice a year. And it's had a whole string of really important editors, too. So, Eric, please read for us. Thank you. some poems, try not to go over 10 minutes because I did not rehearse as I had hoped to. It's all right, you have time. Okay. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Um, so the first two poems that I am going to be reading um, are what I call my grinder poems, and that's just how I'm going to introduce them, I guess. <laughs> West Texas, Journey on. Can Grinder resolve histories of formative neglect and just a few old affirmations from a horny stranger, which becomes the dream composite of the very timbers of those figures, or how I imagine Freud explaining it? And from this windshield trance, how have I come over the West Texas thaw like a fugitive 
throwing out every traffic cop. A place like this could get to a person under the flesh, inescapable chronology of dead, pulled out of, the, out of dusty graves, rumored with gold. The dream is none of this. Even if it rides the Wi-Fi signal, offers accompaniment for a moment, illusion propels me toward false idols, immediate but not immaterial, to desire a recognition beyond the arbiter of the puzzle box. That's all to say, after I escaped the cops and homophobes, after I forgot what paranoia could gnaw out of me, after the bartender closed in Santa hat and patchy mustache, after he came back to my hotel, after he left, after he followed me on Instagram, after he unfollowed me on Instagram, what can I say? I was infatuated with that kindness. Uh, so this, the second poem is another uh, grinder poem, but it was written in a very different way. Um, when I lived in Houston, I, I would drive, there was a period of time where I would just get in my car with some coffee and just drive around the city. And Houston, if you've ever been there, has a particular kind of vibe. Um, and these poems kind of came from that um, kind of harsh uh, urban landscape. Reptile Sonnet. <laughs> Always out of ether come the boys from the Greek to ignite, orb, not in heaven, but ashen, smell of burning plastics, pixelated, limbic, leaching out by an inguinal nodule, out of containment, in imaginary space, when rain makes the words a comfort of pig Latin and full averted kindness, soft tissue signified and provoked, put the auto in arrows driven homebound, wipers squeal at the fallen sky, the dark always gets in the way, seasons of words constellate around the meeting of two GPS points. The next two poems, I'm just going to go through and not really introduce them. <coughs> like sand. All the contraindications come out like sand, the salt that collects around the failures to weigh, condensation of seaside nights coiled up together in the sand in the salted algae musk. Bodies filled with sand, even words were sand. Loose hands, the squeezed shoulder, sand, a dried Promethean clay, an unspoken film screen. We watch in place of the ocean that threatens inside our throats, suck of tide. There will be no more swimming, only mud. The contraindicated beer mud on the floor mat the piss mud on your pants, the mud as you spoke, threatening to return to mud, the mud that quickens with struggle, mud in the shape of eyes and hands tracking you, carrying you into moon, moon tide, these mud houses. Reasons for Living, after Reginald Shepard. It's the summer before becoming ourselves. Final fire turning sand to glass, no one photographed. Every Pacific sunset is one, and yet all of them. Photos are a scam like people who offer up a moment like a tenderness. A eucalyptus, frail and flammable, Old growth, clear cut, no clean rain, nobody, just a stone swallowed in us forever thing, <coughs> evades us every day except for that day. We live like a white pine does for no one, dark and quiet. One grew through my belly, paralyzed and not myself was I a 
a tree? Was that the reason? A tree might be a reason. It's silhouette even. of a longer poem that I've been working on. Um, it's kind of a documentary uh, poem uh, about my time in California, you know, and my experiences of homelessness there, and, and just uh, kind of meditating on that. Um, so hopefully it will make sense. This is kind of an experiment. Thank you for letting me experiment in front of you. Um, and I'm just gonna start with a, uh, a quote from Jack Spicer. What are you thinking? I am thinking of how many times this poem will be repeated, how many summers will torture California until the damned maps burn, until the mad cartographer falls to the ground and possesses the sweet, thick earth from which he has been hiding. Jack Spicer, Psychoanalysis and LG. And the name of the long poem is Eleven Eyes, which is named after the um, 360-degree camera that uh, Google Maps Street View uses. And so this project incorporates a lot of that, but I didn't really want to do like a slideshow or something. This upholstery covers coastal drives, fog like polyester velveteen, thin lint November falls drugged, a sun on tide pool stone, exposing wrinkled anemones. An ease of paradise sets in. Beachcombers, now corpses, invasive tarps encroach, dying in plain sight. Mexican fan palms, the coded signs of life. Dreamers colonize the dream upon waking, upon writing, upon living. The fires will take what is theirs across tens of thousands of acres. The redwoods smolder for ages. Ash muddies the rain, tears open air, paradise hidden in the mouth of tourist trap, phantom of coordinates, west to the edge of a thought. Dream worlds coalesce, Co coagulate, curdle, wet sand, wet crevices, wet itself lends to smells of life, infection, death, beauty hidden in its mouth, to mistake beauty as a thing in itself, it is not, is, the sanderling that never lands. I permeable, permeable to a wounded world. To want to end to myth is perennial trapping. I myth maker, cartographer of grief. How I wish to buffer the hum of Pacific, to fill a liminal space of bright sand. That is hope, to grope toward another word, stretched from an edge where God, grief, attachment, lean always over and outrun meaning, meant for beauty, vigil etymologies. Weak by blue dusk, the words are looking. Thought, fight of our ragged senses fetched in the long eye, leaked into unconscious river, seismic, split from the earthy heart, soil soldered by wildfire. What I cannot say is the feel of living of its fleeting. Okay, I think this will be my last poem. Mission District, San Francisco. May the best dream win. The dream from which Freud says, we never wish to wake. The body has a language of its own. Since 2010, there have been over 930 instances of human waste reported at the corner of Mission Street and Sycamore. A single palm adorns, sunset gradient, real or advertised, 
the row of sycamores was suspiciously like eucalyptus, bearing graffiti, claims to territory, looked suspiciously like city tags for removal. Do we know where we stand? Only when we cannot hide the body's language. Thanks. It's my pleasure to introduce Colin Bischoff. He is from Georgia. He spent a lot of time in Athens before uh, he studied <coughs> at the University of Georgia. So this is home turf. Welcome back to Park Hall. And he has his, uh, earned his MFA from Georgia College and State University. He is from Winder, Georgia. And in between, his, um, in between all of this, he actually spent four years in uh, South Korea where he taught English there. Um, and uh, Colin writes about the South, Colin writes about Georgia. I read Colin's work and fell in love with Georgia once again. Georgia really comes alive in his work and that's what he draws from, that's what he writes about and he is very inspired by the stories of Georgia. Uh, welcome Colin. Thank you for that introduction, that was, uh, that was flattering. Um, everybody hear me okay, okay great. Um, so I guess what I'm gonna read is gonna be a little bit of a, a change of tone because I'm reading uh, prose, not poetry. Um, but it, it is, uh, like I already said, I uh, most of my life I've lived in Georgia and so it's where I set most of the things I write about. Um, and so what I'm gonna read is a story that I'm, I'm, I'm basing it kind of around, there's a, um, you know, the 1996 Olympics that was in Atlanta. There was a pipe bomb that went off during that time. And so I had this idea for, um, maybe kind of circumstantial, but I have the idea of, of this woman who um, has abandoned her husband in the moment, in the, in the weekend, the, this, this bomb is happening. And she's sitting in her, her hotel room and is watching this on the news. And so sort of, it's sort of a dive into her psychology, what's happening when she you know, is, is hates this guy, but also you know, is, is, is conflicted with how she feels about this, this guy she's just turned out on. Um, so I'm gonna read, um, she kind of starts off with sort of a broad survey of stuff happening in the 90s and then goes into a more in-depth, um, dives into her psychology. Uh, so this is called um, Games. And I'm, I'm gonna, I, I timed myself, I'll, uh, I'll get my watch running so I don't get over. Okay. You're good, we have time. <laughs> we got time, okay. Okay, well, uh, th this story is called Games. Um, it was the height of summer, the height of July, a day for setting records. As temperatures climbed and Americans celebrated the gold medals of shot putter Randy Barnes and swimmer Brad Bridgewater at the Atlanta Olympic Games, as Tony Baskins and the Spice Girls rocked houses and music charts on both sides of the Atlantic, as the world dreamed of cloning sheep, and Monica Lewinsky dreamed peacefully next to the president, as children blocked to theaters in droves to watch Harry the Spy, and the fugitive terrorist Eric Rudolph took the first steps of what would become a seven-year spree, Mindy Whittemore watched the morning news from the queen-size double bed in a Marriott hotel 50 miles outside her home in Savannah, Georgia. Perched on the comforter in blue slippers and a satin nightgown, she leaned, learned that in the wee hours of July 27, 1996, during a late night performance of the R&B group Jack Mack and the Heart Attack, a pipe bomb had been detonated inside Atlanta's Centennial Olympic Park where her husband, Ted Whittemore, doctor of dental medicine, had attended. Dozens were injured, at least one dead. Clinton was calling the bombing an act of terror. Well, that was something, wasn't it? Wasn't it? Mandy wasn't sure. She brushed back the golden curls of her five-year-old daughter sleeping next to her. Ted's daughter, she reminded herself. Ellie, short for Allison, named after Mindy's mother. Ted was staying with his sister in Buckhead for the week, so like him to run out on her when, she knew he, when he knew she couldn't follow along. She looked at the phone and began dialing his number, then stopped, staring at the television. What if he didn't pick up? What if something had happened? She returned the phone to its cradle. Well, she thought something already had. Uh, the idea of runaway had come to her barely a day ago. Giving Ellie a bath, she found herself longing for a cigarette for the first time in half a dozen years. 
The more Ellie giggled and splashed in the bubbles, the more furious Mindy became at Ted for leaving her behind when he knew how badly she wanted to get out of the house. Game to be damned, she wanted to do something for a change, something more than just sit there. That Ted had invited her along only made things worse. The idea that Alice, that thorny reminder of Ted's first marriage, could watch Ellie was beyond her as if her teenage stepdaughter knew anything about looking after her child. Exhausted, she rested the sponge on the edge of the tub and listened to Ellie hum a tuneless parody of Under the Sea. Five years is a long time to be a mother, longer still when you spent the first year realizing you weren't cut out for it, and the next four resenting yourself for ever looking at a man. You could hate mothering and hate the man who'd done it to you while still loving the child, couldn't you? Couldn't you? She watched Ellie splashing in the tub. Of course she loved her father. It was impossible not to, yet crouching there on her knees, drenched in lukewarm bath water, head fogging with fatigue. She knew Ellie was the only child she'd ever have, she looked through the second story window of the house she and Ted had built together, viewed the manicured lawn, the blue green swimming pond, the pair of stiff maple trees between, between which just outside her line of sight, their bull mastiff Samson would be resting his massive head between his forepaws, pink tongue lolling on a pile of drool. It wasn't that she was too old for another child, not yet anyway. 34 was still young, wasn't it? Quite young, Ted said from the other side of 50, not that his opinion counted much these days. It was more that she realized she had no more room in her heart for what other women called the maternal instinct, no more room for love. Not since that afternoon three months ago when she'd taken lunch to Ted's office and found him in, in the break room with Cora, his hygienist and the fire director. The noses pressed together in their hands, nearly brushing as they perused a, southern, a spring edition of Southern Living. I noticed she stood in the doorway and watched, uh, and watched for God knows how long, startled at the way the air seemed to hum and sizzle around them, chemistry so catalyzed it sparked. She was half ready to throw the tub of spaghetti at him when Ted's secretary, a chubby, breathless girl in the woman 20, approached Mindy and asked, genuinely, clueless as a chimp, if she was a patient of Dr. Whittemore's, was she scheduled for a biannual cleaning, a filling, a fucking root canal? Mindy nearly shouted in the girl's face. A mistake, she told the girl, a misunderstanding, a joke. It must be hard for other women, she conceded, staring at the television. Nearly 100 injured now, with more on the way. She might even take some pride in the fact that she'd married a man like Ted. Ted with his bear's lap and pelt of tawny chest hair, earthy musk. <laughs> The unshakable oral fixation that left, that even after dental school, left him always with the toothpick in his mouth. The aura of success and boyish gleam in his eye that revealed a man convinced he could do no wrong. Ted who fucked his neighbors as well as loving them, who paid his tithes and confessed his sins while forgetting that the biggest dues he owed were to his wife and daughter. Daughters. And to think he wanted more children, sons, ha, huh? that was before. Ellie came along and proved herself a bigger handful than any boy back when Mindy's hips were smooth and childless. And Alice was all he had to carry the family name. Alice had been no more than a toddler when Mindy met Ted. Now we was 16, she sprouted black bangs and had the unnerving habit of wilting the moment Mindy entered the room. She was hardly pretty, below those black coils hanging from her scalp, skin so pale. And drawn, you could practically feel the bones <coughs> creak Yet yeah, for whatever reason, she reminded Mindy of the way she herself had been once, wise enough to smile through eye rolls and suck breath mints after smoking and wait at least half an hour before vomiting after meals, young enough to believe that grins were golden and to leave cigarette cards in the waste bin and to ignore the fact that all the flushing in the world couldn't hide the smell of sick. Oh yes, Mindy had been quite like that once upon a time, once upon a not so very long ago. When men were lovers rather than hyenas and wolves, and to be loved, she fingered the bone in its cradle. Ted, we'll be all right. Mm -hmm. To be in love is to be swept from your feet on some aisle in Europe, carried over dunes in your wedding dress, and planted ass first into a clump of pampas grass. Some hope that, some joke, something. Trying not to think of her husband, Mindy brushed the curls from Ellie's forehead and gently pried her daughter's thumb from her mouth. She still sucked it daily, a habit Mindy had tried to break her of, and which Ted found 
constantly annoying. It was part of what she liked about Ted. He seemed to enjoy tormenting her rather than caving to her wishes. Um, skip this bit. Uh, the, the men before Ted were all the same, confident, sex hungry, possessed by the delusions of self control. One or two had even been smart. Ted was the first man to make her work for her attention, the first to treat her like an equal rather than a queen. To stand his ground, she pushed her more often than not to push back. She loved him for that once upon a time. Now and forever after, she was running away. How am I doing on time? Good, okay, I'll go a little further. Um, mommy. Mindy sat up in bed. Ellie stirred next to her and stretched her arms above her head, a plea to be tickled. Blinking sleepily, she fixed Mindy with a blue stare that drifted accusingly to the cigarette, and she lit it, in Mindy's hand. Shame filled Mindy as she doused, heard to douse it in the ashtray. Time to get dressed, Elle, Mindy said, helping her to her feet. She should have smoked in front of Ellie. Mindy's mother would have swished her ass with a hickory cane and washed her mouth out with soap, that's for sure. Told her thing, such things weren't fitting of a mother. It was such a, it was such a strange thing, wasn't it? This mothering, Mindy's mother at least had gotten what she bargained for. She always said so anyway, that she was cut out for it. Mindy felt different from the moment the doctor had ripped her daughter free of her womb and placed her squirming and screaming in her arms. Mindy hadn't been able to shake the thought that this, this mothering wasn't what she'd signed up for. The mothering was the thing she wanted least in all the world. It was a bit like this god awful heat they were having, sudden, intense, overbearing in its warmth. It was a heat that frightened her, wasn't it? She helped her daughter peel off her night clothes. God damn it, yes. The heat that was a bitch. When's daddy coming? Ellie asked later when calm, calm and but naked, she sat wrapped in a towel on the edge of the bed. Running a hand through Ellie's curls, Minnie opened the suitcase and unrolled her mismatched bundle of cotton outfits. Uh, she selected a pair of green dungarees and held them up. Put these on Elle, she said, waving them invitingly. Ellie studied, Ellie studied the clothes and her eyed the clothes skeptically and shook her head. Birthday suit, she screamed. Uh, she shook free of the towel, rolled, rolled to her feet, and then turned an awkward cartwheel and landed upright, a testament to the tumbling lesson she'd attended these past months. Before Mindy could stop her, she leaped onto the bed and bearing off, jumped up and down. Birthday suit, birthday suit. I'm in my suit for birthday soup. Mindy sat down and shut her eyes. After several moments, Ellie collapsed into the bed, deliquescing into a fit of giggles. The reporter on the television said Clinton swore he'd catch the perpetrator. Well, what do you know? She'd done a bit of catching herself these months, hadn't she? Leaving Ted's office that day in April, she felt so stupid, so used. The early mornings and late night stream of business calls he took after dinner. Yes, so it made sense. She'd been such a fool. Cora with her, meowing vocals and insufferable simpering in Ted's presence. Crossing the lot that day, she dumped the spaghetti beside Cora's moss and prayed to the God of good and holy things that her husband and his mistress would slip and break their necks. For a while after that, she blamed everyone for her failing marriage. Ted, her mother, Alice, her daughter. Looking at the childless, looking at Ellie beside her now, lying spread eagle on the bed, sleeping fast, she felt a stab of shame. Lately, she hadn't blamed anyone but herself. Uh, I'm gonna stop there. Thank you, everyone. Um, thank you, all of you, uh, Colin, Eric, and um, Jeremiah, for this wonderful reading. I have a few announcements, but I just wanted to say something before. Uh, I'm so happy we're doing this, uh, and I really wonderful to see all of you. Uh, when I was in, um, I was in, I was doing my masters in India. I uh, used to write a column for a newspaper, and I used to often talk to the editor uh, what kind of a nature the column used to be. It was about books, and she used to say that um, we should think about local, global issues with a global outlook, and we should have local and global uh, uh, conversation about books. So it was too long, so we started saying local. So I think in so many ways our program represents the local spirit, global as it is local. We have someone from Georgia, we have someone from Texas, we have someone from Nigeria here, and it's really, really wonderful to see this uh, incredible range of talent. Um, I have two announcements. On October 5th, we will <coughs> in the same room at 4.30 p.m., not 6. Um, uh, we will have uh, visiting writer Nahid Piroz Patel. She will uh, do a reading and a book signing. 
She'll talk about her uh, writing unlikable, unpopular women characters as protagonists and the consequences you pay for it and why she likes to do that. <laughs> <laughs> and then on November 2, we will have um, the founder of Radical Books Collective, uh, Professor Bhakti Sringarpuri at University of Connecticut. She is uh, the owner, founder of this book, book club called Radical Books Collective. I'm sure we all know about Reese Witherspoon's book club, Oprah Winfrey's book club, Every Celebrity book club, Roxanne Gay books club, book club. But what is happening with or because of this is that uh, there is a kind of a, uh, overprivileging of books published by corporate publishers. Uh, books that are very conventionally told, they're, which sell everything in a very consumable way. So Bhakti, my friend Bhakti was very wise about this. And so she started this book club to support indie publishers, university presses, writers who work with small presses, poets, uh, and writers who are radical. And so she's gonna talk about the D word in American publishing uh, and how, what are the problems associated with it and, and, and uh, what Radical Books Collective is doing there. So please come here November 2nd, again, 4.30 uh, p.m. Thank you so much all for coming. There's food here, eat them, take them home. Don't forget about Susan Powers' reading. Yes, thank you, thank you so much. We also have, this is on, September 21st. So September 21st, we have Susan Powers reading, who is going to release her new novel. There will be a book signing as well, and it is happening here uh, in the same room, uh, probably at 4.30. Yes. Yeah. Thank you so much. And it, as I said, stay, hang around, let's talk to each other, and uh, please eat the food, take the cookies, they're really nice. Thank you. <laughs>